Allow me to introduce you to um, <laughs> Craig Sherbrooke. Oh, yeah. um, Craig is a writer who crosses many genres. Many years ago, he was a playwright and won the Walt Cherry Playwright Award. He's written two very well-received memoirs, Hoi Polloi and Muck. He's written collections of poetry, and just recently now he's written his first novel, um, which is this, The Amateur Science of Love. He's an essayist and journalist, so he's done really everything there is to do in the writing trade, and uh, I'm going to be asking him tonight some questions about how it is that you kind of find something that you think, what am I going to make out of this? What form is this thing going to be? How we use that material from our lives, our lived experience, to kind of bring those things together. Mm. And this is Kate. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, when you're introducing someone and running through their biographical details, there's always the risk of getting things wrong. Mm -hmm. I was at a writers' festival a few years back, and I had to keep leaning across to the person and saying, "No, I was born in Sydney. Oh, yes. I no longer work as a journalist for that moment." Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, so I lean across if I get things okay. wrong. Um, uh, there aren't many premiers literary awards in the country that Kate hasn't been shortlisted for, whether in prose or poetry. Her best known book is the internationally published The World Beneath, which was People's Choice winner uh, for the New South Wales Prem Lit Award, which is a lovely thing to be known for, a People's Choice, anything. Um, she's a renowned writer who wins people's hearts, I think it's fair to say, so if you've got the critics and the prize committees and the people on your side, you're doing pretty well. Her latest collection is uh, The Taste of River Water, can you hold it up, okay, which is um, a collection of poetry which has been shortlisted for the Victorian Premier's Award. And the bookmakers in Darwin have it at seven to four. <laughs> or, although Nick Xenophon is trying to ban gambling on literary awards. <laughs> I should also say Craig's book is also on the Victorian Premier's Literary Award shortlist, so it's a bit of a kind of snap coming That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Different categories, thank goodness. <laughs> Different categories. Um, uh, reading her poetry, it's clear that her sensibilities are very rural, uh, and uh, our rural Australian, plain speaking, informal, un-British. She lives in Benalla and Kate on a farm, cattle farm. Kate, when you went off, you went off to study professional writing in Canberra mm. and you stopped writing, as everyone does, you said, um, because analysis takes all the joy and mystery out of it. Why? <laughs> See, I can tell already that Craig's got his information on Wikipedia because yeah. <laughs> that's the one place that that quote seems to keep coming from and it keeps coming back to bite me because I, I did say that one time in the interview, yeah. um, that this idea that um, you go and study writing and you kind of, what you get very good at, and I must admit I was doing the very first ever BA professional writing way back yeah. in 1981, yeah. which uh, um, at the University of Canberra which was just a centre for advanced education back in those days. And now, of course, every university in the land has a um, professional writing degree and a master's and usually, a, you know, mm. a doctorate as well. But what I really found was I kind of got very good at, um, at criticism, particularly of myself, which is always, you know, a killer for a writer. Um, and I... When I finished, I was good at doing that, but I had found that um, the thing that had been um, an enjoyable or enthusiastic mm. thing in me that I had before I went to university, which may well have been, you know, to do with being a child or being a teenager as much as anything else, I, I did, it kind of had, had left me. And I, had, I did actually feel incredibly callow, I have to say, because mm. I finished that degree when I was about... I must have been not quite 21, I think. Mm. And uh, I, I, it became immediately evident that I had nothing to say and nothing to write about in my life. I had to actually have... A life. A life before I had something to write about. You and put I, the cart before the horse. I did. Yeah. I did. And, we, and it's always been that lesson to me ever since that... 
you know, I often think one of the problems is if I look at when things are going wrong, I think this is the problem. It's all form and no content. I need to think about content and then hopefully I'll feel the drive or a kind of a, a growth edge of energy about that subject or yeah. that content and the form hopefully will be something more seamless and transparent and it will come more easily rather than this kind of trying really hard to kind of think about form and structure. And the, um, in the, se- the September the 9th, Yes. edition of 1960 of the Times Literary Supplement, yes. which I have at home, has a fantastic essay written, I think it's by F.R. Leavis, mm-hmm. where he um, rails against the Americans for professionalising writing mm-hmm. and taking it down this route of trying to teach people to write mm-hmm. rather than have, and he was an academic himself, but taking it into the universities rather than having people live a life mm. first. And the great British writing, he said, always came out of people who came from, they might have gone to university, they went to university, but they came from unexpected places in mm. life and therefore they had unique experiences to bring to their work. Whereas the Americans tended to sort of think that if they go to university, the stories appear on the page mm. from there, like produced in a factory. Do you think that's a little bit true? I do think that's true, and I think it's true. I, you know, I, I look at your work too and think, yeah. well, y- you are in that great tradition of you've sort of crossed all these different genres. You know, you've, you've written practically in every form that there is, you know, and well, it's like... Well, well, writers used to up until yeah. the 19th century. Yeah. It's just this professionalising of specialising. Specialisation is an very evil. recent, yeah. It's what doctors do. Let them do it, you know. <laughs> yeah. they, they want to be proctologists, let them. <laughs> but, but, uh, but I think it, but writers traditionally up to the 19th century have written across all forms, and, mm. you know, they might do a bit of plays and then some poetry and, and then some prose. But their body of work is is all of them mm. and manifested in all their different forms. It's only recently that you've, with the professionalising of it... That we're meant to narrow you're down. You're meant to narrow yourself mm. down and be a novelist or a yeah. memoirist or a poet. And, and you're seen as a bit of an aberration if, in fact, you've, you've done something different or suddenly you've produced a book of poems or, in your case, after all these different things, you've now it's time for your, your first debut novel. It's like... Yeah. There's, how do you feel about that idea of um, uh, the thing I've been getting asked about recently, which is um, when you have an idea, you have a concept, when something's kind of nagging at you to write about, and you look at it and you're sort of circling it like a, you know, a dog with a buried bone or something, and you're circling it, thinking about right. it, and how you're going to kind of gnaw on it and right. think about it. How do you think about what you're going to make out of it in terms of form or in terms of genre? Does it occur to you that this is a better poem than it would be if it was a short story or a, a, an essay or something? Well, my, my poems are sort of poetry. I've always written a kind of like very short, short stories. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I like, um, I don't like abstraction in poetry, if I can avoid it, mm. I like something that's rooted in concrete experience. And so a narrative form I really like um, in poetry, and it's, it's something that's very hard to do, which perhaps is why people don't do it. Mm. More, you know, in po- poets tend to want to do that um, the sort of symbolic abstractions, which are easy to do, wordplay, word magic, it's great. You can you know, riff on that stuff to the cows come home, but mm. to actually craft it into a story is very, very hard. Mm. And it takes a lot of work. So, um, and a lot of times with me, um, I, if I might start out writing a poem, and then it might find its way in, as it happened with the Amateur Science of Love, bits of poems I'd written years ago mm. when I was in my 20s. <coughs> um, narratives mm. found their way into that book, and in and, and the memoirs I've written, Hoi Polo and Mark, poems were being written at the same time as, as, as bits in, in, in the memoirs. Well, just having read and reread all of them, I can certainly attest that there are whole phrases and whole sentences, and I think, they wow, just, there's that image again, that, you know, in the same way. They come in, and the image is because it's, your obsessions keep getting worked over, mm. and, um, you know, because I write so autobiographically as you do, mm. we're, we're similar like that. We're, right close to the bone. Mm. Um, uh, it seems quite natural that things are going to keep coming back and looping and, mm. um, and being refreshed, you know, and uh, in, in different forms. You've said before, and I'm just thinking about an interview that you did um, with the Amateur Science of Love, mm. um, 
you talk about your characters and you say the fate these characters endure in many aspects have come from my own life. The sort of fiction that's always interested me is where there is clearly an author's lived experience driving the book. You can tell by the details. Real events have been joined up with imagined events and imagined people. And we were just clearly discussing this um, backstage earlier. Um, that's also really true, isn't it? It's, it's, with poetry, it's, it's nowhere to hide in that sense. It's, it's impossible not to kind of ground it, it seems to me, in genuine lived experience because the kind of subterfuge or the fictionalisation, it doesn't seem to work so well for me in that narrative poetry. When I'm trying to yeah, write yeah. it, you're trying to get down to that the close to the bone. You know? yeah, well, I've always, everything I've ever read since I was a kid, I, I didn't like it if it seemed made up. Mm -hmm. if you could see the mechanics and mm -hmm. you could see that somebody was trying to be clever and make something up. So for me the great writing was obviously coming out of lived experience mm -hmm. and, and the autobiography would be running close to you know, almost being um, uh, given a second life mm -hmm. you know, um, by the author you know, by, who, who was uh, using matching you know, uh, lived experience with something that he imagined. But you know, poetry, about, I reckon 90% of it would be autobiography, right, going back through time in all the various languages, particularly English language poetry, and the, the great poets who think of, you know, when John Milton wrote Paradise Lost, which is just a marvellous work, if you can get through the footnotes, mm -hmm. um, uh, it's still the stuff that was really of his, you know, his great Lysidas, his, you know, great poem for his best friend. Uh, an elegy mm. that, that 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 sings for me, and you know, or Browning, or or um, a great another great narrative poet who could make stuff up, but when it actually was his lived experience, mm. something Suddenly he did, there was a big there, is there? really when it yeah. when, when it jumped up and bit you, and um, and I think that's the same for prose. And let's mm. face it, I mean, if you think just pulling a name out of the hat is not necessarily a favourite writer of mine, but somebody like Hemingway. Mm. I mean, if you took autobiography out of his um, over, there wouldn't be much left. The mm. same for Christina Stead, the kind of thing for Janet Frame. Mm. Um, mm. So it's just, you know, it's just what you do. It's interesting, it's really, what you were saying before about that kind of, um, you don't really have an interest in that kind of abstract poetry, which, um, and I don't either personally, which kind of um, doesn't have something driving it, which is a, a sort of a story. Yeah. Because it really interests that grey area between sort of, I suppose it is between prose and poetry where you can do, you can take something that poetry can do beautifully, which is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a metaphor here in your head somehow that in three weeks' time when you're driving along in the car is suddenly going to detonate. Like that's an extraordinary thing to be thinking, mm. to try and keep your hands on those levers, isn't mm. it, when you're writing? And yet there's something else you can do that we can, I guess, learn from prose, which is I can drive this with narrative that's going to make this reader want to actually see what happens next. You know, there's mm. like there's this great marriage of two things that I have found is, well, it, obviously it, it's something that can inform prose beautifully, because I also love, you know, imagery and metaphor and stuff in prose, but boy, when that can drive a poem mm. and you're paired right down to what a poem's trying to do, mm. it just seems like such a perfect form. And of course, Paradise Lost is a beautiful example of what mm. else could that be except a long narrative poem? It just is a perfect form for the, the, the thing he's doing there. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, but we, we, um, we throw this word imagination around mm. as if we actually know what it is. And we overuse it, and we, we so I think we mean it to be when we make stuff up mm. out of thin air. And I always recall, you know, Dr. Johnson and Charles Lamb, the great essayists, you know, of of uh, of the past, who would always be wondering the unreliability is of, of imagination. Is there such a thing? Do we actually have an imagination? Mm -hmm. And if we do. Is it just making stuff up? And if it is, it's worthless. Mm. Because you, what's the point of just writing stuff out of thin air? It's not saying anything about what it is to be a human being. Mm. It's not giving lived experience um, a form on the page, which is the point of literature mm. in their view. Mm. And I think I'm with them. Mm. You know. And you know, it's not always pretty, is it? You no, know? no, it's it's you know, the human experience isn't mm -hmm. isn't isn't pretty, but it's. Uh, uh, you know, it's it's hopeful. Would you mind reading something? If you wish. Could you read um, something from the Amateur Science of Love about one of those moments? Uh, <clears throat> um, 
I said that everything leap, loops around yeah. for me, you know, and so this, about 1988-89, uh, I wrote this poem, which is lived experience of a relationship I was in. I was a very young man witnessing for the first time a, um, a woman who'd had a mastectomy, who was my lover at the time, um, who'd had breast cancer, who, uh, and I was watching or well, witnessing her scar for the first time, and it found its way into this novel. Um, it is an honour to be taken into someone's wounds, their real wounds, not their emotional gripes. Wounds that cut the body until it is less whole, less human, and no amount of healing can make it complete again. To be taken into someone's wounds is to be trusted to recognise that only their flesh has been ruined. It may be revolting to behold this wound, but it has not wrecked the rest of them. I was about to be taken into Tilda's wound. I was about to witness the ultimate nakedness. I waited outside our bathroom door until I was called. We'd been back in St Tilda four days. It was time to get my first viewing over with. She told me to wait until she showered and gathered her courage. She warned me that her right side was like a breast without a nipple at the moment. And this was because swelling remained on her. The idea of that swelling pleased her. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the swelling never went? A nipple of swelling is better than flatness and pokey rib showing. I tapped on the frosted glass door. Your audience awaits. I could see Tilda's shadow moving about in there, shuffling this way and that. I suppose she was deciding where best to stand. OK, she called. I'm ready. Care for what you say, won't you? A nervous giggle parenthesised the request. She whistled a few tuneless bars. I could, have been expected, I could have been inspecting a new outfit she'd bought. I finger brushed my fringe out of the way like I was going on a date. The death awe returned to me. Death was about to show me its true face, the face of the god of disfigurement. I was determined to look it in the eye and not blink or turn my head or, grass or gasp. I might not be a crier when it's required of me, but, honesty box, this was my finest hour of intimacy. I turned the knob and eased the door open, making the steam swirl out. Tilda had wrapped a towel around herself like a long bra. Her wet hair had furled in a bob, and she had brushed blueness onto her eyelids. She smiled with a mouth of purple lipstick, though I could tell it was more scared grimaced than smiling. She stood up straight and adjusted her boat bony shoulders back and forth, unsure of their correct setting for this occasion. Forward made her bust too concave, she said. The other way made it stick out too falsely. Here goes then, she closed her eyes, held her breath, and let the towel drop. All right there. It's, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Like, it, sometimes it seems to me that whatever it is that we're writing, whether it's kind of prose or poetry or, or non-fiction, it's all in the paying attention, you know? It's all in the noticing of small things. And you don't know you're noticing. No, like the frosted glass on the bathroom. Everything. You know, that just occurred to you when you were writing. That yeah. you, it's like a memory that you, that you bring in and remember. That's what it was actually... That authenticity thing is like you're pulling threads in. It's just peripheral vision, and it mm. is like you've... You know, your flesh is a sponge mm. that sucks all these images in that circulate your body and then when you want to write them out, they're just there mm. and you don't even know that they've mm. been there all these years, you know, suffering in silence under your skin. Saved. Yeah. Why don't you read Colostrum? Because that's a lovely right. poem okay. of, um, of uh, the... <coughs> The, moment, the, the beautiful moments in life when nature comes up and that's right. reminds you of, uh, of all the beautiful things. Actually, that's interesting. That you must to suck you. into your skin. <laughs> that's right. And it's one of the, you know, a lot of the poems in this collection are about water or about liquids or about, you know, one of those things, of course, you know, you couldn't really find a more metaphorically rich liquid in life than colostrum really could you no um so i'm going to read it and I, it's good to read this one because it's an example of what you were saying how um a poem that you wrote has found its way into prose now and it kind of it's like you you, you pull apart a scarf and read it into something else yeah. this i was reluctant to write this poem because i had some notes and a few drafts of it as a short story right and when i was thinking about how the collection was going to work i am um, uh, I thought it had to kind of fit in there. Yeah. It seemed to fit, and I knew I'd have to kind of cannibalise, well, let go of, I suppose, give away the idea of the short story somehow, yeah. because 
it's just a better fit in here and as a poem, so I'm, yeah. I'm going to have a read of that one under it. It's 52. Okay. It's called Colostrum. <clears throat> Barely speaking, we get the cow into the yard. Her rejected calf lies stunned on the ground like a wrinkled black coat dropped from a chair. The cow's having none of it. She swings at you, staggering but game, roping you with slobber, your shirt already slippery with blood and shit. The smell of afterbirth, mammalian, unmistakable, makes us unable to look at each other. Back lashes a furious hoof to sink into my shin. It's almost a relief to allow pain a hot, skin-broken focus away from the sight of her desperate eye rolling. The white of it curdled with intimate, exposed terror. Push her up into the crush, you say. Tie her leg out of the way. We lift the flopping calf to her udder. He sinks, wanting to sleep till death, and buckles exhausted back into the dust. And still we cannot meet each other's eye. We rouse him again. His little mouth tries and tries to connect, too small to even reach. Now we both see what's ahead hand milking and hand feeding, the chore of keeping this one alive, or just walk away. Open the yard, let the cow stagger trembling to the shade of the tree, let the calf slip away. His mouth opens. Inside his soft palate is rippled like a seabed. He tries to nurse your fingers. Get a teat, you say finally. There's one in the kitchen drawer. When I get back, you've milked her, and we tilt the calf's neck, work a finger into the side of his mouth, slide the teat inside for that first quick convulsive swallow. Your hands cradle the head without a shred of sentimentality. I crouch there, tipping that bottle of precious colostrum, watching your tired, decisive calmness. My bruised shin, which I've forgotten, starts to ache, and I could hold this still moment forever. The thick, antibody-rich sweetness of that first milk, and the feeling of sensation returning, drop by tentative drop. Oh, yeah. I hope I don't get arrested for saying this, but it's a very erotic poem, too, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you Want know. me to read you an erotic poem? <laughs> OK, read an erotic <laughs> Why not? Oh. How often do you get the chance to do that? Yeah, come on. <laughs> Wait till I just find it. This is a very old poem, actually, and it's interesting. I put it in because I, um, I had a collection. My very first thing I ever kind of had published, except for a few short stories that won prizes, was a really short little collection of poetry that was released in 2001 mm. called um, Signs of Other Fires, about mm. my experiences living and working in Mexico, and, uh, which, is, of course, is the most you know, essential. And so anyway, I wrote this poem, and it's one of the f only ones that's, that's sort of come I into this collection from the Mexico collection. It's called How to Eat a Guava. First, rinse the fruit, rub the skin and inhale. Make an incision with the eye tooth, a bite with a seesawing motion to break that curved yellow moon surface. Eat it like you would kiss a long lost lover, like you would taste the skin behind an ear. You cannot worry about juice. Separate the seeds from the flesh with your tongue, sift them down your throat. Recall custard in expensive affair-soaked hotels, lemon mousse drowning the mouth in reckless garden sun-sweat tussles. Eat it like you would plunge into a river in moonlight, like you would open your mouth and let the river in, like you would eat a stolen pear, a hot fig lush as a love bite. Eat it like you would crush it onto skin. Lower your head, confusing perfume with texture, tasting scent under a collarbone, like you would lick a line of sweat up a spine. Bite skin, flesh, seeds, juice. Eat it fast like you were ravenous, parched, gluttonous, flushed with secrecy. Eat it slowly. Lick your fingers. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to tell you, I went to do a residency at a high school once, and it was, I don't know where it was, it was one, for exclusive girls' school, and uh, I, the girls who were in year 11 and 12 were going to do some poems as part of their kind of um, analysis, and um, a little group of girls chose this poem, and I said, oh really, when you feel like doing a little presentation, just email me, and um, you know, if you want to ask me anything, and they emailed me and said, dear Kate, how do we do it, what's that poem about? <laughs> 
Remember, girls, six. <laughs> I'm gonna, you've got me started now. <laughs> Uh, the the home and um, assignations oh, yes. aren't they the most erotic things to have assignations? They ramp everything up, and this is found. This poem found its way into that mm. um, uh, pub book, uh, Amateur Science of Love. But this is a short. <coughs> But I hope this catches infidelity well. Mm -hmm. It's so hard. The country towns, it's very hard to have, commit infidelity because you can't go to the local motel. So you've got to find your way, in my experience, to the forest. Let me just take some notes. Um, <laughs> and and uh, so, assignations. Um, doors of old hallways creak in the branches like creeping upstairs couples, whose every movement causes the shady lighting of the sun to swing. We rug the space between our cars the air provides no locks, so at first we flinch at every noise through slits in the tree trunk curtains. Luck so far these seven times. A roo might thump down the bushes' alleys, or a parrot grind its scooter throat. But no one to rush the word to town that we make the forest our motel, whose leaf taps drip for the hour we stay, and our hands must flick smooth the ground's hard bed from the wind's last use. Beautiful. Yeah, at least that's how I remember it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? <laughs> Isn't it beautiful? There's that beautiful little inter moment that it can only, it's like the idea of like the leaves are dripping like the taps in a motel room. It's yeah. like, it's a beautiful thing, isn't it? It's yeah. the thing that the poem can do in the sort of, I just love the way that it's sort of got that incredible stretchy capacity to kind of um, do something that prose probably can't do with quite so much distillation. You well, know? you distill everything, don't you? Mm. Yeah. And it, it, no, no word can be there that doesn't belong there. Mm. Um, it's like, you know, the erotic itself. You know, <clears> you don't, you want to discard that which doesn't focus on the pleasure. But for that reason, I've actually found it really, um, it's a scary place to be, having written a book of poetry, because of that very reason, there is just nowhere to hide. You know, mm. <laughs> it's not like you can kind of, there's no padding possible, there's no kind of subterfuge or even hypocrisy possible. You just have to, if, if someone doesn't like that, it's, it's, you've got no rules to go, that's all you've got, you know. When, when you, like, tell me your routine a bit, like you work on a farm, do you, you work on your farm. I don't do too much work on the farm, you just don't? to be honest. You no. bludge and you write. Ah, open the occasional gate, we had a discussion. We had a discussion <laughs> before about... See, I don't even think of writing as work, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, you don't either. No. It's not, and I always think, because I grew up with manly men who mm -hmm. work was physical and, um, or it was, you know, it was having a profession where you, you, you were doing something you didn't really want to do. That <laughs> yeah, was work. that's work. I agree. And um, with this, when you go into your study and your, your desk and, you, you know, you are doing what is really a calling and therefore it's not work, it's... It's something else. But your routine, when you, you know, you're, you're bludging and you mm. go into your desk. It does feel like bludging, yeah. I have to say. But, yeah. but what things do you bring to the desk? Do you have ideas when you come or is it just form off the page? Or do you, you know, because you're very sort of, you know, I mean, nature appears everywhere in your work. So obviously it yes. comes from the farm into the study. Yes. With you. But is there something you use, a, like a structure? Of um, ideas for the for the ideas. I do I do tend to take notes, or if something appeals to me that I've read or that I've seen, or oh. I, I tend to try and think about that. Often it's a little quote, or it's a word for something that I've seen. That's yeah. it, it. Really reminds me very much of um, <laughs> like picking up a guitar and just like noodling away with chords. It, it, if there's any comparison or analogy, I do think it's like kind of not being very good at a musical instrument and wishing you were better mm. so sitting in your room by yourself trying to sound a bit better or make those chord progressions sound better mm. and then you go back to a couple that you know you can do mm. well and then you try and say it's always that kind of pushing forward a little bit and so to, to me it's like I, it, it's a good day to get to get something done to get something onto the page that you can mm. always work with and I'm sure you mm. know the, the, Many aspiring writers, and not just writers, of course, who are studying writing at, at university, but everyone who's kind of trying is at a different level of expertise. You want to get something on the page, don't you? Because you can fix a bad page, but you just can't fix a blank page. It's like <laughs> there's, you need, I feel like I need something, no matter how bad, to kind of 
to get me started. Mm. And often I, I don't think too much about uh, why this today, why, why this, why now. I, I just try and let that first draft be mm. as kind of awkward and... Um, but that's a Catholic approach. Yeah, it is. I'm a Protestant approach. Okay, so you need to nail down what 900 a, words because you're an ex-journo. No, so no, well, I, I have, no, I, I have, everything sort of has to be formed pretty much in the head by a lot of walking around and thinking mm. until I come, you know, to structure it. Till it's it all. almost complete when Til you come to write. it's almost complete and then, it's, yeah. and then it's just, you know, putting it into the verbal form. But it's, it's much more organised than mm. that. And that's just because I'm a very, you know... Um, you know, tight assed kind of person. Mm. You know, I sort of have to be like that. You know, I, I have to be organised and I'm a neat freak. You know, everything has to be in its place and the pen has to be pointing this way. And, mm. and A lot of writers are like that. We totally, laugh, but it's true. It's like, quite, it's quite, um, it's quite, it's almost obsessively in obsession. You, know, you need to the, control all the environment before you can. And all the people yeah. in the street and the barking dogs. And, <laughs> <laughs> but but it's it's like it's isn't it like that it's it's uh, it's which is why it's not work. It's yeah, it's not work. It's, it's it feels too, like a it's kind too of too psychiatric. A, for yeah, that. it is. It is. Yeah. You and your invisible friends alone in your room, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and the voices. But it, it, it is. And to me, I suppose I always see it as I, I try not to see it as the work thing. I try and see it as the you know not that setting too Pollyanna like the mm. privilege that it really is that we are sitting there doing that thinking about our preoccupations and our ideas and how they might all kind of fit together. And it, 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 to me, it's the whole process is one towards a sort of a coherence. You know, and often I've just learned to let things sometimes feel a little bit incoherent when I start because when I come back to it, there's like a thing that happens in the unconscious where it's like you set yourself a little problem or, or a puzzle mm. and you can pretty much guarantee that when you go out and hang out the washing or do you know, some dishes or get out and do anything else, on some level that we're hardly aware of, I think that puzzle has been kind of worked over. Solved, yeah. And when so I come back to it, it is a little bit more solved. Or something will occur to me that I would never have predicted or been able to write had I kind of set down all my structure on the page next to me. It'll be an organic kind of turn or a shift, and that's... I love that little rush of energy, that little shift where it's taken you a direction that you probably could never have found had you tried to nail it all down first. So, yes, maybe it is a Catholic Protestant thing. I don't is, there, is there somewhere... We talk about this autobiography. Is there somewhere where you wouldn't go, where you wouldn't want to go and bring to the page? It's interesting you say that because I always feel nervous about using um, uh, other people's stories and lives as material without me putting it through that kind of filter of trying to fictionalise first. Mm. Like, interestingly, like I feel a little bit of stress, for example, reading that poem Colostrum because the person I'm talking to in the poem is here tonight, for example, who has his own take on that occasion and his own memory of what that meant and how that went and so on. So there's, to me it's like, I probably wouldn't go where I would hurt someone's feelings to the extent that I have um, used them entirely as material and they have, I want to do them justice, I want to do people in my life mm -hmm. justice of creating you know, using the kind of family and friends, I suppose, as we all do in our writing, as they find their way into what I write, I want to, I want to do them all justice and all their dimension and sort of fallibility, and that's what really interests me when I read as well, you know. And so I want that kind of fullness of experience there, but I want to make sure that I'm not going to make someone feel betrayed by me taking something of theirs. In other words, you don't want to be a journalist. I don't want to be a journalist. No, no. and I would, and say so you can laugh at that, but it's, yeah, it's very it's true. Really true. It, it's very true because one of the things that um, uh, being a journalist and I've worked for, uh, for 20 years mm -hmm. as a journalist is that what you're not aware of when you're young but as you get more mature you realise is that you are actually using other people's lives mm. and their traumas and their tragedies and their victories for commercial gain mm. to lie in your own pocket to justify your wages mm. and you're getting facts wrong and you're rendering their life down to cliche and you platitudes and that. you don't mm. really care about them mm. which as Janet Malcolm you know the the um, American writer has said about journalism that to paraphrase it you know nobody worth their salt who's a journalist would know well, everybody anyone who's worth their salt who's a journalist knows that what they do is morally reprehensible mm. so once you um, 
realise that, and it took me a while, I'm always slow on the uptake, coming to writing serious writing, and there's a huge difference between a piece of journalism and a piece of serious literature, in my opinion, mm -hmm. um, is um, it's very freeing knowing that all that betrayal is happening out there in the big world. And if you're trying to do something serious, you um, do, as you say, do some some life, your own, others, justice, mm. and the experience, and you're doing it for a serious moral purpose, you are freed, and you do have more license, yes. I think. Um, and uh, so I, uh, yeah, I feel um, that's the way I feel about it. Mm. But journalists don't. Oh, I don't want to reduce it. I want to kind of somehow... That's about it. reducing uh, and mm. rendering down to cliche and yeah. plenty, which is a terrible, terrible sin. Mm. But it's a vice that we've, we've almost comfortable with well, as a society. As you were saying earlier, it's like we're starting to see that you know, the chickens come home to roost in terms well, we of reprehensible right. journalism at the moment. I don't, you think know. I don't think it'll change. I don't think it'll, I don't think it'll change. I read a poem about journalism. OK. Uh, then we this, might have we, some questions. We, then we'll yeah. have some questions, because this, this has um, found its way... This didn't find its way into our book, but it's... Um, this is when I realised that I was on a moral... Moral slide, and I had to get out uh, when I realised, when I witnessed this. Um, it's called Journo. My desk's across from racing. I'm murders, pedophiles, falls from grace, who bellow back through a fly screen while my pen wags across the page. I make stick figures without limbs, a foot with a snapped leg, half an arm, three fingers bent back splayed. I have no second language unless you count these stumps of words I use, scratches and splinters on shorthand paper, at first glance a sheet of music but with all the notes broken. My hand's a plastic telephone, I shoulder it kinked against my ear, top lip kissing the speaker dots, grievers refuse to talk to me but I'm sorry for your loss is enough to finesse their heavy thank you breath, the allocution of trust. For Comment, professors of everything begin their quotes with the usual, oh, it's sad. I wait for the dead to happen. That's why they call it a deadline. I yawn to the new girl, like showing off a callus, a scar. She frowns admiringly. She's never seen a corpse, but wants to. Mm. Mm. That's it, isn't it? I never want to show off a callus. That's right. Or, mm. or show off a scar. It's a really beautiful, you know, concise way of putting it. I just... Wanting to seem to be tough. Mm. It's a virtue. Do you want to take some questions? Yeah. I don't have any questions. <laughs> run these now. Um, I have a question about uh, how you both feel of what qualifies as being a... Australian voice, you were both talking earlier about how you take a lot of uh, inspiration from English tradition of writing from, um, I suppose, a level of realism rather than abstraction and personal mm -hmm. experience. Do you think overall there's an attitude in Australian writing to avoid abstraction or do you uh, <clears throat> feel as though you're representative of that or against it? Mm. There you go. So do you think that there's an Australian tradition of... of how you feel about abstraction? Do you think that you're part of a... Oh, I'm, I'm, I mean, I eschew all the abstraction if I can. I like to make things clear, not make things more obscure. Mm. And But I think abstraction's a cop-out. I think a lot of the time it's a way of seeming to write a lot of words but not saying anything sensible. Mm. And I think the Americans have a lot to answer for <laughs> from that um, because they gave us, I mean, I mean, for every one good poem that Wallace Stevens gave us or John Ashbery, they gave us um, verbal sludge to steal from A.D. Hope on. <laughs> um, but, um, and, and that's, it's just not doing human, humanity a favour to, mm. and it's not doing poetry a favour to actually throw it back in people's face as a garbled mess for them to sort out. Mm. It's not doing, I mean, to me it's, um, you know, uh, poetry or prose writing is should be very hard and it should be concise and clean and uh, as clean as it can be and um, if uh, if not I think you're being lazy and mm. incompetent okay. that's my view <laughs> I suppose for me, I, you know, I, I do feel I've, I, I want to stick 
in the sort of realist tradition. I am, I am a really big fan of um, story and storytelling and narrative, and I feel like. I feel like there's so much. I've got a lifetime of exploration still within that convention, within those con and that makes me conventional. Well, that's okay. I can just get on with my work over here because I, I find that there's so much still that I feel that's so energised and interesting about exploring within those conventions. And all you can really do, I think, when you're sitting at the desk, as I'm sure many writers in the room know, is the only real kind of little lighthouse that's beaming out there out of the darkness is I want to write the kind of things that I like to read, really, isn't it? Because it's always going to be reading that conversation that never finishes, that beautiful experience, um, that, which is like you find another kind of relationship, don't you, between reader and writer. And uh, to me, that's always been, you know, that is my virtual community. I found that community the day I learned to read, and it's never going to change for me. If someone said to me, look, you can either read or write, which you rather do, I wouldn't hesitate. It would have to be reading rather than writing any day. And um, so to me, I feel like, I, I feel, I just want to explore within that convention of realism because I know what gives me kind of satisfaction and inspiration and joy is not so much abstraction. As you say, that idea of it's a mess for the reader to sort out, I feel like I would be failing if I left that in your lap, I guess. I want to make sure that I am being as clear as I can and there isn't that subterfuge or that hypocrisy or that striving for effect or that sort of laboured sense of I want to show off my good vocabulary. I, I'm, I feel like I'm just so uninterested in all that stuff. What I want to do is give you the jolt that something gave me. That's what I really want. I want to move you and I'll do anything I can to do that and whatever direction that takes me and that's what I want to do. It's not for effect, it's for that beautiful jolt that's going to connect us in some way, you know. So it really clarifies me to sort of sit and think, well, there's plenty within the structures and conventions that we've established over millennia that I'm still interested in exploring, yeah. I, I know a writer who writes with, um, writes quite a bit of poetry, with a big dictionary mm -hmm. beside his, <clears throat> his, his, you know, nest of pens um, <laughs> and, um, and flips through looking for the you know, it just all pops up in all the uh, you know, multisyllabic words, words that I think are, all, are arcane, uh, dead language, and not doing it to sort of, I don't think, to try and revive those words, but doing it to sound, or to be pretentious. Mm. Could you get more smart. marks for more syllables? You didn't have but it's not, anyway. it's, not a, it's not a contest, is it? It's, it's not it's, a contest. It's not no. an examination where the professor comes and says, I say, there's some jolly good words Excellent there. Excellent word. Yeah, yeah. It's not. Yes. Yeah. It's a, yeah. Any um, This one's for both of you. Um, what was the trigger that caused you to go on the writing path? What suddenly switched on that said, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life? Yeah. And it is like that, isn't it? It's a bit mm. like falling in love, isn't it? It's a, mm. It is not a rational decision, obviously, because, <laughs> I mean, why would you do it? I think for me there was a, as I said, I was always a really avid reader. I'm not sure about you, uh, Craig, mm. but I, I can't remember a time when I couldn't read. It was always an absolute, mm. you know, compulsion. And I loved, I loved um, feeling the thing have an effect on me. And then a day came when I suddenly found myself thinking, how did he do that? When did I start feeling that? Wait a minute. And it was like something, a, a switch kind of was flicked that was almost a diagnostic switch. And I guess that's what I mean about, that's, that's the kind of form thing I guess I'm talking about. That's my idea of what form is. That glimmer of recognition that, oh, I, that's why I started feeling that back there. This person has laid this beautiful trail for me, thinking all the time of me and my react. There's a really beautiful quote by Michael Andachi where he says that the first line of every story should be the same line, and it's this, trust me, there is order here, very faint and very human. And I, that's, that's my idea of the relationship that's going on. And I guess to want to do that, not just enjoy a story, but to think about it in that diagnostic way, I want to join my voice to that kind of chorus, I guess, and have a try to let you feel that I'm going to lay that trail for you in return. Yeah. Well, I'm, I was uh, um, an only child, and um, in a, growing up in a, um, a hotel, 
which was a pretty rough hotel. Mm. And um, a, a lot of people who write, you've you come across uh, a lot of people who write or become artists uh, are only children, mm. you know, because um, you have to amuse yourself. And, you know, they have brothers and sisters to play with, and and it was a kind of a hostile environment. This hotel, so I was always in my room a bit, and and started to um, uh, started to lose myself in my thoughts. Uh, probably to a deleterious degree, you know, or you become quite a fantasist. But I remember, um, I, I wasn't a great reader as a boy, because um, nobody I knew was a reader. Mm. No, my parents didn't read really anything. My father read the odd sort of detective book or spy book or whatever. But I remember somehow, somewhere, someone had left on a kitchen table uh, collected works of William Shakespeare mm -hmm. and I must have been getting on just approaching my teens and I remember seeing it was like the Bible in fact I thought when I saw it it was the Bible and we weren't a religious family so that was an unusual thing for a Bible to be on our kitchen mm -hmm. table but this was the alternative Bible which was Shakespeare and I remember flipping through it and it seemed like this must be the voice of wisdom because I actually could understand a few things which seemed like boys' wisdom, mm. boys' own wisdom, like, you know, neither borrower nor lender be, and mm. I sort of just f found my way through a few things and um, f found a few lines that made sense. And it seemed to me that um, I wasn't getting a great deal of input or wisdom from any adult around me, and this was where wisdom must be. And it seemed important to have wisdom. You know how when you're a, you were a kid, used to be, you know, when I was a kid, people always talked about reading as, as, a, as a, something that was full of effort, like a, you, to read an improving yeah, book. It was onerous. So nobody ever read for pleasure that I knew, mm. really. My father, the odd spy book, as I've said. So I started reading full of effort and earnest, and an earnest belief that I would be uncovering wisdom through basically the pages of Shakespeare, even though I couldn't understand so much of it. Still can't. Um, but, uh, and it's pretty true, it was plenty of wisdom there mm. and, um, and it seemed to almost replace the adults. The adults became, the living adults became secondary. Isn't that a beautiful thing? In the, it's like the here and now, the real people. Yeah, well, pushed aside. Don't seem to offer you the same thing as someone who doesn't even live in your culture, who lived 500 years ago. Lived 500 that years seems ago. closer to you. That seemed closer and, uh, you know, and so I, yeah, they replaced mm. the adults and that seemed to go and stick with me. The one constant thing, after all the relationships fade away in your mm. life, after all the jobs you get into and then get sacked from or move on and the countries you go and live in, the one constant is that there's a book to read and there's something to write. So it becomes um, the one constant and then it develops into a, mm. you know, to a life from there. But that's, how it, that's how it did for mm. me. But yeah, you could do worse. If you want to be a writer, you could do worse than be a, an only child. <laughs> Low sperm count, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I want to ask whether you believe there is a relationship between a talent and an understanding of music and writing. Mm. Are they related or is it possible to be quite unmusical and be a writer? Mm. I'd like your opinions. That is a really good question and one that I often must say I think mm. about. Mm. That, and it's interesting. Uh, I've come to kind of think about this when I'm looking at my own writing. To, it's sometimes helpful to see it, it sounds ridiculous, but to see it as you might listen to a piece of music, to think where does it need uh, a, a change to a minor key, where do I need to bring in some other kind of instrumentation, where is there going to be a silence here, and then how can, what's the next thing that's going to come after that silence? It even makes me think about the way in a song you have that kind of bridge, like the middle eight, where it kind of uh, turns into a minor key and then it's, it, it sort of comments on the rest of the song. It's really interesting how it's been useful for me to think about that. Now, I am not a musician, but I, um, 
I, I sometimes feel like I, I wish I could approach, uh, I wish lots of, all of us as writers could approach our writing with the same kind of quiet diligence that musicians seem to approach their music because I don't hear so many musicians complaining about <laughs> never having any money and I bought my instrument and I'm not even in the orchestra, you know, which is what seems to happen sometimes with writers is that we have this kind of weird um, aggrieved sense of entitlement about if we're doing the writing and I haven't had any success and all I've had is rejection and I'm not cutting that. That's, that took me half an hour to write. You know, that kind of sense of, of aggrievedness and I never hear it from musicians, I must say. And the other thing I love in that kind of analogy way is... It's made me realise, um, you know, when we were, you're listening to someone on stage and they're playing music and they play a piece of music and it's thrilling to us um, because we know what we're seeing in that beautiful virtuosity. What we're seeing is that beautiful four minutes that's come from thousands of hours of invisible work which we, we're not witness to, we're not privy to. What that person's giving us is their kind of invisible labour. I really love that idea of that's what something is that you're right. There's this kind of invisible iceberg of lived experience and, and thoughtfulness and sorting and finding coherence and stuff. And that's all my stuff that I'm thinking of. What I want to give you is the... Is, is the the seven or eight minutes that's going to give you that jolt, you know. And so it has been interesting. I, I wish I wish there were more writers who were really competent or virtuosic musicians so we could hear. And, you know, I have to say my idea of a poet laureate is probably Paul Kelly. In, you know, I, I certainly look at, at sort of singer-songwriters and think, wow, that's, that's like a poem, but it's something bigger because it's also a song. It's also music, and having said that, I actually went to see uh, Leonard Cohen last year um, with Paul Kelly supporting him, and uh, there was a couple of bits in Leonard Cohen's concert where he stopped his fantastic band, and he actually uh, recited a couple of poems to those thousands and thousands of people. And you could have heard a pin drop. It was a beautiful moment to think that that is the connection that we're getting right down now to the kind of uh, elemental sort of connection between what an artist is thinking about and what they're giving and the way an audience is receiving that thing. So it's a, you know, it, we have to now get, I think, more into sort of storytelling and, and sort of performance and live, live storytelling to, to sort of retain that beautiful um, live connection, I think, between readers and writers. What do you think, Craig? Well, it's an interesting question. I, I, I love the mathematics of music. You notice how really good piano players or violinists yes. are often very good at math. Yes. You know? And um, uh, and I know that uh, some of the writers I greatly admire, like James Kutsia, for instance, who is a, trained in math. Mm. But what I think you get from, um, uh, what you learn from musicians is the practice. They, you mm. know, that's the hours of practice to be able to play um, a piece of music. Um, and the... Um, uh, the practice that goes into, if you bring that same diligence to the mm. practicing of language, but the musicality in language, I think there's that little pocket of energy inside you that, uh, is, I, you know, I think this, that um, uh, that when you are starting to riff on a line, when mm -hmm. you're starting to, you know, to use that word, musical term riff, you can kind of feel that you're playing some internal music of mm. yourself for yourself, to mm. yourself, but it's not music, it's wordic. Mm. <laughs> it is. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. 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 So, yes, but it's, it's true, there is something there. It's, you know, wordic, I'm going to use that. <laughs> but thank you very much for, yeah, thank you for coming, for coming on, a, on a Monday night when um, you know, you obviously are homeless, and you've <laughs> <laughs> it's been very generous of you to come and listen to us. And yeah, thanks nice, a lot. It's been nice to talk in front of you. And thank you, Craig. It's been nice to talk thank to you. Thank you for coming down from your cows. My pleasure. <laughs> thank you.